Okay, uh, I'm here with Deborah Foreman, a literacy leader, experienced teacher and classroom researcher from Adelaide in South Australia. She's the author of the brand new Nelson Phonics in a Box series. Joining us is Simone Calderwood, primary publisher at Nelson, a Cengage company, and the publisher of Nelson Phonics in a Box. So I'm gonna begin by asking Simone, how did you come to discover Deborah as an author? And why was she the right person to create our new phonics series? Hello, Brendan, and welcome. Yes, look, it's great to be able to talk to everyone about our new series, um, Nelson Phonics in the Box, and we're very excited about it. Um, so in terms of, um, I think Deborah and I must have met, I think it was about two, two and a half years ago, and I did come across Deborah through um, a sales rep from South Australia who told me about this teacher that was working with this really great program in a school in South Australia and was achieving brilliant results in, in what she was doing. And so I went across to South Australia and met Deb and Deborah talked me through the series and straight away I could just see the appeal of the series in that it was just so very practical and so easy to use. And I really love the fact that Deborah had been actually implementing this program within her school for quite a couple of a few years and she was really getting great res results from doing that but also just straight away I could see that it was just so accessible and the fact that it had that practical use in the classroom I could really see how it would be really appeal to so many teachers. Thanks um, so Deborah what led you to create the new phonics program for your school in the first place that that Simone then heard about um, and visited you? Well, I guess it all started um, like, you know, there, there are so many programs and approaches around. Um, so, and, and I kind of, our school had played a little bit with a few of them, but I think for us, we kind of got to the point um, that although there's programs and other ways of doing or, or approaching phonics, um, I could, I had this real strong connection with, well, what actually sits behind it? And so you can have any program, you can have an approach, but without that background knowledge um, of how to apply that in your teaching and your learning, it kind of led me on my own sort of pathway, I suppose, of working out how it all works. Um, and when I started doing that, I, I've always had that real strong belief that every child has the right to learn how to read. And what I was finding um, with my own little cohort, because I, I worked with junior primary for many years, um, was I, you know, you, you could give them the tools, but then that next step, next step of being able to apply those, that knowledge. But yeah, so I guess for me, it was, I wanted to know more. I needed to know more, even about what was around, but it didn't quite fit um, as I was doing my research into that next bit. And that was having, you know, little readers being able to apply those skills. They were, you know, caught up on lots of the, um, little, I guess, um, uh, songs and things that were connected to the text, uh, to the actual sounds, but not connecting that print to the sound, I suppose you could say. So that's where my journey began. And I, yeah, I, I really unpacked it, you know, that backwards by design. So in year two, what do my students need to know? So I went back to year one and then back to reception. For us in South Australia, I know that's different everywhere, but that's our first year in school. What do how do we get there basically in that junior primary? How do we lay those foundations solid to be able to build upon once, you know, they get to that more um, primary age, you know, where they're applying these skills. So that backwards by design took me right back to um, creating stages. And that was doing that one-to-one -one letter correspondence. So teaching just a collection of letters and being able to immediately be able to put them into action so that's why those six letters were brought together I played with those letters for many 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 well a long time let's say I, I would say months maybe even a couple of years to see um, how you know like those first six in the set one of this you know the box now we can call it the Nelson Phonics in a box one um, you know, within those six letters, so many words can be created from those. And it's that purpose of, we're actually learning these letters to be able to make words, uh, we'll spell words, decode words. Um, and it gives it a purpose straight away. I think that was the bit that I couldn't find. I know, um, well, yeah, I guess that's the biggest thing for me was giving purpose. I always go back to purpose with whatever we're teaching. Um, and yeah, so I suppose, Oh, I feel like I'm going off track a little bit no, here. No, no, look, uh, one, of, one of the questions that you, you've actually answered, but I wanted just to come back 
for a little bit of um, specific answer about is the order of introduction. And you talked about that first set. And one of the things that you know, we've um, already had uh, comments about from, uh, from teachers is about the introduction of M, which is slightly earlier than in some other. Now, obviously there's a lot of different programs or series around and yeah. some of them have the same order, some have different orders. You've thought through that very carefully. So that, that those first six in particular, and in particular the letter M or the sound M, why was that introduced um, early? Can you give us some insight into that? Yeah, sure. So like lots of, I've obviously done a lot of research around this, but I guess my approach is really around, we speak before we connect with the print. And one of the very first sounds that little people make is that mm, and that's a very easy sound to connect to. And it's also an easy print letter to, to connect to as well. And it goes, you know, you can make a lot of words, uh, two and three, well, three phoneme words, two, three phoneme words out of that letter uh, immediately as well, once you start to introduce the vowel, a couple of vowels. So that was the whole idea, I guess, and that's my approach. You know, we do speak before we connect with the print. So it's about that phoneme, the sounds that we hear and we make and connecting them with the graphemes. And that's obviously the letters and the letters that represent those sounds. So that mm comes right back to very young, um, just making that connection, being able to identify, um, it, it was it is just a sound that does come up in research as being a common first sound. So it made sense to, make that immediate connection. And then um, the other letters within that set were you, were you would sort of immediately be able to give that purpose of making two phoneme, two sound words and three, you know, CVC, consonant vowel, consonant words as well. So that's the, it, it did come from research. It wasn't just something I pulled out of, <laughs> out of my hat. It was, uh, it is about connecting to that sound. And, and very connected to purpose. So getting those kids started making words creating words, being able to decode words as, as early as possible. Absolutely, yeah, yes. Yeah. Excellent. All about the purpose. All about the purpose. <laughs> so so um, phonics as a word is often used as an umbrella term for anything to do with the sounds of the English language, but clearly underneath that umbrella term of phonics, there's some, some terms that are very meaningful and that teachers really need to understand. Mm -hmm. A couple of them, phonological awareness, phonemic awareness, and then once we've talked about that, maybe talking about the why phonics is then used as the umbrella term. Can you give us some, um, you know, some insight into what phonological awareness is, what phonemic awareness is, and then phonics? Sure. So phonological awareness is all around the sound. So um, it's all around hearing um, the initial sound in a word, the final sound in a word. Um, it could be around the rhyme. So being able to hear the same sounds at the end of words. Um, alliteration, so again, that same, same sound at the beginning of two or you know, three word phrases. Um, so it's all around the sound. There is no connection to print with phonological awareness. It is all around the sound. That's all we're listening for. Phonemic awareness is that next bit of being able to identify where the sound sits in a word. So again, there's still no connection to print. It's just around where that sound sits. So in the word big, what, you know, what's the first sound you hear in the word big? But what's the final sound you hear in the word big? But what's the middle sound? It. So it's about still doing that connection to sound um, and orally. So that's, that's those two. And then the phonics is when we bring in the print. So it's about connecting those um, initially, the one-to-one -one correspondent with those first 26 letters of the alphabet and connecting that phoneme, that sound to the print. And then of course, building that up to, um, you know, one or two letter graphemes, which like the sh and that's, so being able to build slowly as well. But to be able to do that, you have to have that, you know, phonics um, uh, foundation of making that connection initially with the print, I suppose. And then within that sits under the phonics, it's about using that language of blending those sounds together to read words. Um, and then segmenting, being able to pull those, you know, hear the, hear the word, being able to um, spell the word as well. So that's kind of the blending segmenting um, comes into it then. But the biggest difference between phonological and phonemic awareness and then phonics is the connection to print. The first two are just about the sound, yeah. Excellent. No, that's great. 
Um, Simone, the decodable storybooks in Nelson Phonics in a Box are bright, engaging, and feature a satisfying narrative. Can you tell us about how these were constructed to be both decodable, but also enjoyable for students? Sure. So the intention of the decodable storybooks is that students will actually move on to the decodable storybooks once they're familiar with all the 26 letter sounds that they're introduced to in, um, in the phonics in the box. So they'll go through those five sets of letter sounds. And then once they're comfortable with all of those letter sounds and they've heard them through the one word readers and just through the teacher's resource book, then they're comfortable to move on to the next stage, which is the decodable storybooks. So we really wanted to create a suite of storybooks that really kind of um, really reinforce those initial letter sounds. But we also wanted to make sure that they that they weren't just kind of a random collection of, of sentences. We wanted to create a, a storyline in each particular book and to have characters and to have animals and toys and all of those elements that young children really um, you know, resonate, that re really resonate with children. So um, that was our intention. And we also wanted to also in incorporate some of those high frequency words that we know that students need to know, particularly as they kind of um, progress throughout reading so that we have included high frequency words that are very easily decodable within the story books. So they'll have a really engaging storyline, but they'll also encounter those really important high frequency words. So Deborah did a fantastic job in creating those. They, they really are engaging and, um, and you know, I think they're bright. Uh, I love the illustrations. Um, so Deborah, the lesson plans in Nelson Phonics in a Box, the teacher's resource book are really carefully structured. Um, can you tell us why you chose the gradual release of responsibility model for the lesson plans? Mm. I think, you know, when, when we um, are covering a range of learners, um, so, you know, when we've got English as a second language or we've got Aboriginal learners, we might have some learners with some um, identified, you know, needs or, um, or have may have even had some identification of maybe some dyslexia. Um, it all comes back to making sure that any of that particular teaching and learning is explicit um, and direct. So that's, you know, that kind of starts that gradual release process where the teacher takes all of that, like, hangs on to all of the um, yeah. uh, responsibility there as far as explicitly teaching whatever it is the, within the lesson. And then moving through that stage of actually um, having a go together. So, um, you know, a bit of that guided and being able to work through that learning together. And then in some cases, it's around the, the children going off and actually doing that learning together themselves. Some little people might need that extra support from the teacher. And then in that case, you can still keep them quite close. So you're still, you know, that gradual release of those that are ready to go a little bit further, but you can still hang on to those little ones that need that little bit extra. And then, of course, you know, that application and or the practice and application quite often um, is something that, not to say it's overlooked, but we do have such a giant, you know, packed curriculum that we kind of get through these bits and then we go, okay, we've covered this, we've practiced it here, but then that's the application side of it that, you know, tried, you know, that, that explicit. And that's why I really liked um, the gradual release of responsibility model and hence, the readers connecting back to being able to go off to practice those skills as well. Um, so that's, yeah, so I guess that's in a nutshell, that's the reason for that particular um, model. Yeah. You, you sort of touched on, on my next question, which is um, in a typical classroom, given how packed the curriculum is, how long, you know, in weeks would you spend teaching the 26 sounds in the first box in Nelson Phonics in a Box? Yeah, look, it's kind of designed around a 10 week program, I suppose you could say. And that's on, a, you know, schools get busy. There's lots of things that happen within schools. Ideal world in about a 10 week period. Okay. And it's about a 20 minute session. It's not a, an overly pulled out, dragged out time. It's actually about getting in there, doing that explicit direct teaching or wherever you're at, you know, with that gradual release model. Um, and going through that process and allowing that time for the practice and application and then moving, you know, into other curriculum areas where you can apply that, those strategies as well. So it's not about, you know, just doing it for that time. It's actually about using those skills and strategies in other curriculum areas across. You know. awesome. Awesome. Thank you. So Simone and Deborah, um, the $64 million question, 
Nelson Fonnison box is the first of three boxes in the series. Can you tell us a little about what we can expect in box two and box three? Sure. It, well, I'll, um, I'll begin and please you, you come in, Deb. So in box two, we're actually moving, we're progressing into the area of consonants. So we're really looking at the whole area of consonants in terms of we're looking at double consonants. We're looking at consonant digraphs, which is a very tricky concept for, for students. And then um, we're also looking at consonant blends. And then we're going to look at those really common and regular onset and rhymes. And maybe you'd like to go into a bit of an ex explanation, Deb, about um, consonant digraphs and consonant blends. Yeah, sure. So the consonant digraphs, I guess that's that, you know, in box one, it's all around making that connection to the language as well as that connection to the sound and the print. So using that language of phoneme grapheme and knowing that those letters are actually representing those sounds. So when you move into that next box, so into box two, it's still using that language, except for with the double consonants and the consonant digraphs, you're using two letters that represent that one sound. So it's about taking that knowledge that has been developed and kind of enhancing or got, gets a little bit more complex. Um, so yes, so that's so basically it's moving to two letters that make that one sound. And then um, the blend, as in the first, so you go for, I guess it's like that scaffolded going from two phoneme words to three phoneme words, but then the blends you can, or, you know, you start to put in the bl, and uh, let's just use that. So you can still hear each of those sounds in those words, but you see a lot, we read a lot of words with the button all at the start. So it's about introducing um, a common pattern within a word, but the language is really important not to mix up the blend, you're blending sounds together to read words. The blend at the beginning of a blend, such as all or all are still their own sound, but we do read them a lot together in a word. So when it comes to that onset rhyme situation, you've got your battle end. So you start to work away from just that phoneme grapheme and reading by sound to actually connecting to, you know, letter pat or grapheme patterns in words mm -hmm. and being able to chunk, you know, that, that next day's chunk. So then you reading the whole word so it's not you know just staying in that sounding out phase you need to really move through that phase and it's really important to do that and that's why this is introduced in the consonant um, blend side of things and the onset and rhyme as well you know the onset and rhyme has as huge um, it's like that it underpins some of that syllable work as well so which will be you know talked about later as well but yeah so that's that's box two <laughs> that's, yeah yeah, and box three, we're looking at vowels. So we'll be looking at um, the vowel sounds that we make, such as long vowels, short vowels, and those really tricky vowels. So, yeah, there's lots lots to come. And lots of work ahead of you, I'm sure. So, look, thanks, thanks very much for um, speaking with us today. And congratulations on creating such a great resource. Uh, it really, it really is, uh, it, it looks fantastic, but I, I know it also is very good educationally and uh, very sound. So... Congratulations, well done, and thank you very much. Thank you, thank you Brendan. Thank you.